Firstly, I'd like to say thanks to um, to Ross and John and uh, Dee and my colleague Donna as well for the for putting these series of um, of seminars together because I think they've they're a, a really useful um, uh, package of resources and and help for for people in politics and international studies across the sector, um, which is is really terrific. Um, with the two organisations um, kind of combining their, their their resources on this as well, um, I have uh, in talking about module design. This does uh, necessarily cover uh, and touch on a whole series of areas that are in uh, in other webinars and um, to some extent in um, uh, the first webinar I did uh, a few weeks ago. And I'm hoping I don't repeat things uh, too much. But uh, apologies. If there is some re repetition in there and I've also having gone back through this slide it is a, a little bit death by uh, PowerPoint slide so I apologize a bit for that uh, but I also realize I've, I've approached this at quite a, an abstract level um, and had intended to bring in more kind of concrete examples from from some of the work we did but perhaps in the discussion one of the things we could do in the discussion time um, I'm hoping I'll can, can get through this in about 30 minutes. Um, uh, one of the things in the discussion time we have perhaps would be to share some examples of, of things that have worked and approaches to module design that have worked. Um, moving uh, on, um, I've divided this into three, uh, broadly three sections. And these aren't in a sense chronological sections in that each of them can be done at different stages of the module design and writing process uh, so it's not a kind of a, a linear progression in that sense but hopefully it gives us sort of three uh, three approaches or uh, ways of looking at the module design process that can you can pull some hopefully some uh, useful material from um, i'm also aware that there may be people here at very different stages in terms of experience and so on so some of this might seem fairly basic and some of it uh, may, may seem slightly less so hopefully um, it's not uh, it's not all too obvious to you and there's something at least of interest anyway let's go on so the three sections the first is thinking about things to do with the sort of higher level planning of the module um, to do with the overall design of what that this piece of curriculum is and where it fits um, the second is thinking about uh, different dimensions of trying to enhance the uh, experience, uh, the learning experience for students and ways we can improve that. And uh, thirdly, and more briefly at the end, I'll just indicate some ideas about how you can think about both mapping and reviewing or auditing your module from a number of different uh, angles that um, may be useful at different stages of the, of the process. So to begin with the kind of high level planning, and this I think will be familiar to pretty much um, everyone, certainly everyone working in UKHE, um, in terms of situating any particular module, it comes as part of, a, in a sense, a, a, a chain from QAA and uh, other external benchmarks and requirements about qualifications, and particularly the QA benchmark statement for politics and international studies in our case within and in relation to which our qualifications whether they're straight politics or politics and IR or one of the subfields um, within those uh, sit and then the kind of learning uh, that we expect of students differs for that qualification depending on which level the students are at whether it's level one first year or, or second year or third year for undergraduate or uh, at whatever stage of masters if we're talking about masters modules and then the module and its learning outcomes and aims and educational purpose uh, is is kind of constructed in relation to where it sits within that and the things to I think some things to think about one is that the, the very different roles or uh, uh, that, that uh, compulsory modules serve versus optional ones compulsory modules the ones all students take so they have to deliver whatever the learning outcomes are of the qualification optional modules can serve a slightly more varied role within uh, any given qualification 
um, and that that differs uh, to some extent depending on what the structure of qualifications are um, and there's a variety out there uh, some very linear and vertical in terms of the progression expected of students others sometimes referred to as either satellite or jigsaw patterns which or sometimes a mosaic pattern where different components of teaching in the end lock together to produce the aim uh, deliver the educational aims that the qualification sets or pyramids and spirals or otherwise people have have talked about the the construction and the structure of qualifications and depending on that your module might serve uh, 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 different purposes within that um, in terms of uh, thinking about the module as well it's worth thinking about what kinds of outcomes uh, you and your students want from the module and I think we're all in areas of teaching where we are beyond simply wanting a kind of declarative um, uh, outcomes from students that we tell them stuff and then they tell it back to us. Um, uh, although there are elements of that in, in many examples of learning outcomes, particularly relating to knowledge and understanding and what we expect students to know about the discipline, about the, um, the, the relevant empirical uh, matter that the disciplines speak to. But nearly, even in those senses, we're also wanting students to do things with knowledge to develop and, um, uh, and use cognitive skills. And particularly, um, I think in terms of um, some important areas that are more prominent uh, uh, now and possibly increasing in prominence around skills and employability and practical and professional skills that we might also build in to our learning. So it's worth thinking about what are these, what are the kinds of uh, um, outcomes we're wanting from students, not least because what the aims we have for our modules are, what those aims are, helps to drive decisions about what kinds of learning experience we give to students, what kinds of material we develop. Now, one way of thinking about that, uh, it's not the only way, but um, so, and I know quite a lot of people find it quite uh, helpful to think about it comes from Biggs's idea about constructive alignment uh, which he summarized as the key is that the components in the teaching system especially the teaching methods used and the assessment tasks are aligned to the learning activities assumed in the intended outcomes that is there's a there's a an alignment between what we want students to achieve from our module and the things we ask them to do and the ways in which we assess those um, but also I think it's worth thinking how those things are built cumulatively both within a qualification but also within a module itself and particularly the case in larger um, credit modules where we need to provide opportunities for students for consolidation as well as further development of knowledge and provide opportunities for um, self or external assessment whether that's formative assessments that, that can get ex feedback from us as teachers or opportunities for their own self-reflection and people sometimes refer to this kind of cumulative building in terms of a spiral or ladder the uh, diagram is the best I could do I couldn't figure out a, a, a way of representing a spiral uh, graphically I'm afraid but um, that's the best but thinking about where ideas are taught practiced further developed learning deepened and then assessed uh, as you progress through any particular module and not forgetting of course the role of assessment in this and i won't talk about assessment much because it was covered so well in the webinar that um, the simons lightfoot and rofe and helen williams gave uh, uh, recently which is is available if you didn't catch that but thinking about creative forms of assessment what role they play and how they link to how they help students to show us that they have attained outcomes, but also uh, how assessment can be a productive and a creative process in itself, that it helps to realize the kinds of learning that we hope students are able to, to uh, develop from our module. Um, moving on from that in terms of planning, um, the kind of, uh, and this I think is, is especially important in in when you're teaching at a distance i mentioned this and talked about this a bit at the the previous webinar so i don't want to labor the point too much 
but the approach to scaffolding drawn from particularly Salmon's work, uh, and but there's some useful publications from Rofe and Lee as well, and uh, the 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 BSA, PSA webinar that that um, that Lesson Bandera did about scaffolding and skills project progression is also an important thing to think about when putting the building blocks of a module together that learning paths need to be gradual with markers for checking on feedback and understanding and assessment built into the material um, that we provide self-check or self-audit exercises for students and also as i mentioned before some formative assessments computer marked assessments or quizzes and polls can be used to help ensure that at that that understanding um, and it's partly because you don't have a if you if you don't have a student in front of you or you have them in front of you much less than you're used to it's very easy to um to to lose students by making leaps that are too great uh, that that they don't have the building blocks with which to understand the, the the more complex or more developed theoretical or conceptual ideas that we might be developing through a module and I think it's also important um, in the current context for students that have experienced more or less only face-to-face -face or mostly face-to-face -face, or that's been the core component of their, their teaching, their learning experience um, with us, where they're switching to a more online mode, many will need some support in terms of relating to the functionality of virtual learning environments um, a lot of their learning will be less synchronous than they used to and that creates demands in terms of time management and prioritization of tasks and so forth and, and they will need help with that as well and in terms of the overall trajectory of a module I think it's also good if we can give students a sense of direction um, of the the kind of journey of uh, as a whole through the module whether you whatever kind of image or metaphor that you find useful for that, whether it's ladders or arcs or spirals, uh, um, um, giving students some sense of how the whole fits together and where their beginning and end points are is also a, um, a useful kind of um, assistance to many students. In terms of the substantive content and stru uh, structuring and chunking of material, um, I think this goes for whether you're constructing an online module or a blended module that combines online and and face to face together or if you're converting an existing face to face module to include a much greater um, degree of online material um, thinking carefully about how you break down that 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 whole package of learning into much more heavily structured and ordered pieces of work um, if it's a if it's a fairly large module like say a 20 credit module um, you may want to think about dividing it into parts or blocks uh, but whether you do that or not you certainly need to think about how you would divide up the work into specific weeks of study and what package of materials you provide for each week for the students to do um, and there it may look somewhat different to the your current sequence of of teaching in many cases um, with a kind of lecture and seminar format the seminar follows the week after the lecture with an online package of materials that starts getting very confusing if the kinds of tasks that you would normally do in a seminar uh, come the week following the kinds of learning that you would have delivered through a lecture it's, and probably much more necessary to bring those two things together in a single week's worth of package um, and the and, and but the weeks then themselves can be broken down into separate tasks and those tasks into separate sections um, and it's important to think about how that's structured um, it's important once you've started to work on that that when presenting the material to students you're signaling or communicating clear pathways through those weeks tasks and sections that you're not just giving them a kind of a more amorphous um, uh, bunch of stuff to work through uh, in their in their own way though um, a kind of structured approach along that on those lines sometimes can work but we need to 
be communicating clearly if we don't have students in front of us saying I don't understand what I'm doing this week we need to be able to communicate clearly to students what we're expecting in each of those um, in, in each of those stages another thing I think that I mentioned this in the in the previous one so I won't dwell on it too much but avoid overly lengthy tasks especially online um, pages of text that students have to scroll down um, endlessly are are extremely difficult for students to to concentrate on over long periods of time so breaking those down lectures we know from face-to-face -face lectures that students attention waxes and wanes through through the uh, through the lecture so think about if you're converting your lectures to online think about separating those out into say three possibly four chunks and maybe think about um, pause and reflect activities at the end of each one so that they're separated out into more distinct chunks of work um, that will hopefully hold the students uh, uh, engagement um, longer but in putting, putting all this together another key lesson um, I think is to avoid too much media hopping that is avoid asking students to say read first part of a textbook chapter then come back online then watch something else then come back online then go back to the textbook as far as possible try to keep the switching between media. each time there's a switch it adds to the student workload there's an added transaction cost at each point so it's quite important where possible to keep the, in terms of your use of media keep that um, um, uh, hopping between media um, uh, to to a minimum uh, I'll just take a drink okay if that's the kind of some of the things i think that that help to shape the high level structure of the module and then how you break down the content into um, a pathway composed of a series of tasks for students i think the second process to to think about is to is to look at how um, we can approach that material and look in at ways we can enhance the learning experience for students that make it more engaging and more rewarding and more effective as uh, a process for students the first aspect to this and in some ways it's it's a very basic one is to think about how you shape the module to design it for retention um, to keep students on the module to to minimize dropouts to make it a doable achievable experience for students it matters uh, retention matters for students because uh, failure or dropping out is a is a, um, a, a tremendously negative thing in many cases there are drivers of, of of student dropping out that are completely beyond our control things in personal private lives uh, or work lives that we we can't really influence but at least we can think about trying to design the material in the best way possible to make it achievable and doable for students uh, it matters for finances whether you talk about the, your university's finances because uh, uh, dropout is extremely expensive for it costs a lot of income um, but it's also important for students as well it's increasingly a focus of uh, external qa processes uh, and i think it's also a really important aspect of of um, equity concerns uh, in distance learning, online learning, there are multiplier effects uh, on low students from low socioeconomic backgrounds or with declared disabilities and so forth. Um, and we need to do what, as much as we can to, to address those as well. One of the approaches um, or one of the kind of models developed at the OU, and this was the outcome of a project that looked at a whole series of internal open university pilots and research projects and so on into retention but also that drew on uh, some of the external um, pedagogic research as well uh, developed by Martin Weller and colleagues um, that, that they summarized as the iceberg model and it, and it gives a whole series of prompts it's uh, it, it was published externally as well as um, uh, within the OU I think um, and they're, they're they're a series of kind of injunctions or suggestions for how we 
improve modules is to make sure that we're giving students an, an integrated package that fits together and makes sense to students that we do what we can to make students feel like they belong to a learning community both with other students and also in relation to uh, the academic staff um, that uh, the material he produces engaging uh, that the material uh, the learning is balanced that is we're not designing in big uh, peaks and troughs um, uh, in terms of work student workload week by week and I'll come back to that a bit towards the end uh, that the material we provide is economical not economical in the sense of focusing uh, very carefully on how it helps to students to realize the educational outcomes the learning outcomes that we have set for the, for the module that we're not overwhelming them um, with huge amounts of material that that uh, is 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 uh, kind of overkill in terms of um, uh, what they need to to achieve success in the module, and also that provides points for student reflection on their own progress, and that gives learning trajectories that are gradual and that don't have big jumps or big conceptual leaps um, at points at which we would lose students. So it's, there are other ways of thinking about that, but that's, you know, one, I think it touches on a lot of the things that, that help us to think about how to design modules uh, with, a, with an eye on retention. Within uh, that, I think also a key series of choices that we all need to make in either putting together modules that are solely online or ones that are a mix of online and face-to-face. Is around choosing modes of delivery and on media. So for um, for the online uh, components of a blended module or for modules that are entirely online, um, I think it's a good idea as far as possible to think beyond simply trying to replicate lecture and seminar. It may be uh, in the current circumstances, in the time you have available and the resources that your university is giving you, that creating an online version of a lecture plus seminar format is the best and is good enough in the, in the circumstances. But I think to the extent that you have more time with which to work on this and more resources are provided by your institution to help you in this, then it's worth thinking beyond that for, when, for, for moving, moving online to try and break apart that pattern um, in a way that makes sense for distance, distance learning. Um, in choosing media, it's very important to think about the, the particular complexity of the material that you're, you're giving. Highly uh, complex conceptual and theoretical material um, is quite difficult to convey online. It may be where short lecture segments uh, have a role, but it might also be a place where print or printable material is available. We all do this anywhere in our research lives, uh, deal with um, complex ideas in, in a, a written printable form, uh, rather than trying to read very dense text on a screen, which often loses students or proves or slows them down, which, or both of which can have a um, significant effect on their, on their uh, progress. And also think about the place of AV when, within the overall kind of package of things that you, you develop within a module. Um, it plays a key role in enhancing material and helping engage students. It can liven up material. One of the things we did successfully on an IR module was to use um, videos of IR theorists, which for some students was a better way in um, to, to understanding those theoretical approaches than simply reading a kind of a textbook chapter or, or a journal article. It's also a good, other good uses of AV is to represent lived experiences of people in different social circumstances and to help deliver a variety of diversity of voice within our modules as well. And I think it's also worth, as far as you can, think about providing alternative formats. That's alternative formats for any student because different students react differently to some prefer more visual 
modes of learning and others um, um, more um, more text-based uh, but also alternative formats for students who may have declared disabilities and learning needs that need to be catered for so that needs to be thought about as well in terms of choice of media and how it's delivered um, I think the other thing to that and this is me sort of trying to think in the circumstances that um, that many of you may be at face-to-face -face universities um, if you're in a situation where you're being asked to reduce possibly quite radically reduce the amount of time spent face to face with students i think it then increases the need to prioritize what you use that face to face time for um, and think about what it is that face to face can deliver that is difficult to deliver online and similarly you can think the other way around what could you do online uh, you know there may be sections of, of 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 what you would normally deliver in lec in lectures actually it would be better use of that time for discussion group work uh the kind of interaction you might get through a seminar um rather than the kind of delivery of information that sometimes forms parts of lectures which arguably could be done by other means so i think in, if you're faced with that kind of choice then that that kind of process of prioritizing a scarce resource of face-to-face -face time in the next few months may be an issue we could also talk about. Um, another aspect of um, the, the learning experience is the, and, and it's a, it's a real challenge, a collaboration, learning communities, and as far as possible, we should think of both formal and informal spaces for student interaction, whether that's forum-based or online seminars. Um, within some of those, uh, I think it's, um, if students are much less in contact in um, in a face-to-face -face sense, then having an online presence from either the module leader or the module team or the academics, that is also something we find is, is is valued by students. Um, in terms of the work done in seminars, I won't talk about this because my colleague Andy O'Kane is doing one of the webinars later in August about moving seminars and effectively into online environments. So I'll, I'll leave that. He knows far more about it than I do. Anyway, um, but also think about things like collaborative tasks that students can do as part of the learning uh, at a distance. Uh, one of the uh, exercises that works quite well on one of our modules is getting students collaboratively to pull together an annotated bibliography of sources um, and also things like peer review Helen talked about this in one of the earlier webinars um, where it's and it has to be constructed quite carefully but where it's supportive qualitative then peer review or peer assessment can also play a role in building that that uh, community and finally, before the, before moving on to the, to the next section, um, uh, two kind of uh, broader injunctions. Firstly, keep it lively. Think about ways of presenting and getting students into the material that is engaging, that engages their interest from the off, uh, and that helps to drive uh, their their engagement and their commitment to. The, the learning paths that we're setting out for them think about controversy based teaching or problem solving or dilemma led teaching um, as, as some examples of doing that and keep it simple focus on developing material that is needed for students to help realizing the teaching aims or the learning outcomes of the module and alongside that build the independent skills rather than trying to make a Kind of encyclopedic provision of all the information you know in relation to a, a topic uh, which if it's not organized and and um, uh, prioritized for students can can become overwhelming both in terms of workload and in terms of their um, ability to focus on on what matters lastly and i'll be finished uh, fairly soon which is just as well i think um, uh, a number of, uh, and this is a much briefer and fewer, so there's only two more slides you'd be glad to hear. Um, um, the, 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 a number of ideas about how you can map your modules from different angles. Um, 
uh, and there are various kind of tools you could develop for doing this but it's worth thinking about these processes both as you're in advance as you're planning your module um, during the process by which you're putting it together either the process of converting your existing module into a blended or an online only uh, a delivery or if you're writing it from writing a new module from scratch it can be used during that process to check on where you are and it can also be used as a review or an audit process once the modules uh, in existence or once students are studying it so again as with several of these other things it's not something that comes necessarily at a particular point in the design process but can be used in different ways at different points in that process i'll finish with this slide um, some some ideas of things that you might want to map uh, for the module as a whole um, the first of which relates back to that point about retention and not and having a balanced workload that doesn't deliver doesn't overload students and doesn't give them very high peaks and troughs of work to do um, for that you need a basic idea of how much you're expecting from students um, you need to try to spread that out as far as possible in an even way across the module and you need some kind of rubric for how much study time you expect students to do for different activities and that will vary depending on the complexity of the material it will vary depending on the media you're using reading speeds as compared to how much time you would give students for uh, uh, video or audio material um, so the there's a kind of there's a whole the whole set of things you need to have an idea of in order to then go go through the weeks uh, the, or the blocks that you've uh, divided and structured your module into uh, to, to to check that you're not building in very difficult workload burdens for students at different times another way of looking through some of the um, uh, package the blend of materials a blend of online face-to-face -face or the, the different types of uh, uh, activity you ask students to do as part of the module is to think about the kinds of learning experience each of those is uh, is presenting to students and getting students to engage with them there's a whole list this isn't the whole list but uh, the uh, activities that are assimilative or finding material productive activities where you get students to actually do something and produce some kind of artifact of some uh, kind um, reflective points of reflection on on learning and so on there's a, there's a whole whole set more um, and that again can be a useful way of thinking about what mix of learning experience the module uh, is giving to students there's no kind of um, uh, hard and fast rule about what's the correct one it will vary depending on what you're hoping students will get from the module and the kinds of material you're 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 including in it um, there's a whole set of reviews and audits that uh, were, may be happening anyway uh, in, in your QA processes, but um, uh, are all uh, useful and valuable things to do anyway, which uh, auditing the, the module materials for accessibility, um, auditing the, your module content uh, in, term, in terms of um, equality and diversity, um, providing a variety of avenues for student feedback some of it might be just ad hoc forum based feedback um, uh, you don't have or you might if you've moved completely online you wouldn't have students there at the end of a seminar and lecture who can chat to and say that they think it's great or otherwise so providing some means for that kind of informal uh, feedback as well as the more usual surveys but if you're moving online or moving large chunks to the teaching online it might also be necessary to think about the existing student end of module surveys that you have and how they need to be changed to take account of how students have coped with the online aspects of teaching and you might also build in uh, processes by which students can then influence the content either while the module is in flight um, through keeping areas of the module empty that students can then with you help to fill those or um, as more normally happens I think student feedback then generates changes in future delivery of of the module for the following their following cohorts and finally back to where we uh, 
uh, began in some ways uh, with learning the learning outcomes of the teaching and educational aims of the module thinking about where each of those are taught practice developed and assessed through the module and that might be very likely will be more than one place but another kind of mapping exercise that you can do uh, in reviewing where you got to and i think in all of this just to two concluding thoughts one is that this kind of ongoing review of um of our teaching is itself a good reflective process for us to engage in in any case and something that i mentioned in the previous webinar it's also a kind of process that it's very good to involve your colleagues in so that there is a dialogue among a teaching team um, or uh, uh, on how you're addressing these uh, these various aspects uh, in your teaching okay i'm gonna stop there i've put in um the these will be circulated i guess they'll put in the any so some references to some of the pieces that i mentioned and um I thought in the discussion, I mean, obviously, if the kind of general questions or comments, um, absolutely fine, whatever people want to talk about. But if there are examples of good design that people felt like sharing or approaches to the overall process of module design that have worked for you, I think that would be uh, good to hear uh, as well. So I'm going to stop sharing and hand back over to Ross, I think. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, uh, William. That was really, really useful, especially as I'm, you know, currently in the process of redesigning my modules uh, for the upcoming year. And there's lots of things that have uh, made me think and made me think twice about some of the things that I've started doing uh, that I might need to change uh, to create extra work for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh i should have done it right the first time it's my own fault but it's been, it's been really useful there are some questions in the chat uh and i'll just kind of go through them as they've come up uh, but if people want to uh kind of speak up uh and share ideas uh just put that in the chat and i can hand the mic over to people but the first question has come through and i i completely thought this myself actually uh regarding media hopping uh, could you elaborate a little bit more, please? Uh, I'd like to exploit the online environment to get them to look at videos, put them into relevant news articles. Uh, are you just saying I should not have them switch between activities uh, uh, to list other majors at the end, or are you advising it to keep it to a minimum overall? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I suppose I'm. Uh, the, the thing that we have in mind when we try to um, to minimize media hopping is is about the environment is not switching between not say getting a student to read say go and read the first half of this chapter that if you have a module textbook say where they go off do that then come back online do another couple of short tasks then send them off to somewhere else then come back online at each time you're moving students away and then back there's a chance that they lose the thread or it feels like uh, uh, it adds to the kind of burden on on students so it's it's minimizing in that sense obviously if you have a a long period of work or a long section of work that's all online you can embed within that um, a whole series of different kinds of media whether it's AV or text or interactive activities and so on um, and, and that is much less it's much less burdensome for students that kind of switching because we're all used so you know we're all so used to kind of the multimedia provision within an online environment so it's not that it's it's more that kind of thing um, obviously if you're sending students out to do some work in the library and then come back um, that that would be um, that might be something else you'd want to set aside a, a longer period of time for um, uh, before before switching back and forth rather than coming to and fro a great deal so it's more that kind of being present in the online environment then going somewhere else then coming back and going somewhere else that that is that is found to be um, uh, problematic for students 
Is that? Yeah, that that really helps me. I think okay. you know one of my uh, things is I've, I've kind of tried to compensate with the lack of face to face by giving them so much extra stuff, and I've kind of think I've over -egged. personally I've over egged my pudding, so uh, that is very useful. Uh, another really useful question, and I think it's something we're all facing as departments as a whole, is building a learning community mm. is a big challenge, especially online. And I think there's a problem around both in the classroom and with a cohort. Do you have any practical suggestions around this? Um, we had this question last time around as well. And, uh, you know, I think it is just a genuinely difficult thing to do. Um, I don't think can, um, it's something that uh, we have completely cracked. Um, the kinds of things that um, the kinds of things that that we try uh, includes sort of required forum based work um, uh, work through some kind of online seminar system we happen to use Adobe Connect but there's blackboard and all sorts of things um, trying to get students to participate in that building familiarity if you have a new cohort coming in building familiarity among that cohort is um is obviously quite important the kind of you know the, the way students get to know each other in a normal university environment uh, uh through just turning up to the same events and chatting around that um it is a difficult thing to replicate but in that i think this is what i meant by thinking about formal and informal spaces. So setting up rooms that aren't really dedicated to, to specific teaching tasks or setting up forum places or cafes or chat rooms or whatever it is, but also allow some of that kind of idle chat among students or um, where they can, can interact on things other than, on, other than the module. I think that's part of it. Um, I think the other, part of it is in relation to the academic staff who they won't if it's fully online they won't have the familiarity with they won't get to know as well as they do in uh um in face-to-face -face universities um so it's ways of making yourselves as module leaders or module team members available um uh, and, and interacting with students in uh in a variety of settings um, I, uh, I think I think some aspects of this will be covered by um, in that later webinar as well on online seminars because that's obviously also a key. The challenges of getting students to engage online is often uh, quite a significant one. In terms of if, say, you're um, delivering a piece of teaching about introducing a IR theory say um, that might be the task you know in this section in this in this task with this part of the the week's work you're going to get introduced to constructivism or whatever um, then that would then need to be broken down into in terms just in physically in terms of the the, the screens or the web pages or whatever it is that students then look at needs to be broken down into a number of different sections that we, we find that if you have long streams of text um, uh, that can be very off-putting for students who end up never getting to the end and just skipping on to the next screen or you might be you know it might be introducing a particular you, you might say the task is introducing a particular topic area and that might be then composed of a number of different types of media some text some interactive some AV and those could be the kind of core core point of the sections within that task. I suppose that's what I have in mind. Yeah, that's very useful. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'll work my way through these questions as logically as I can. Uh, there's a lot of questions around learning community, but I think what Will said was really, really useful. Uh, I expect a lot of us were really doing a lot of online classes. Uh, and face-to-face uh, face for a minority of students who want to attend. Uh, do you have any suggestions uh, on how to balance that? And how you think about these activities and use, use these as opportunities? 
for for um, kind of online seminars is that yeah enrichment uh, activities uh... um, I'm tempted to back that over to Andy O'Kane who's doing doing work on it how to engage students with or in online seminars because uh, there are this there are a variety of kind of techniques for for doing that depending on what sort of tools you're using um, it, it is the case that getting getting students to i mean it's often the case in face to face seminars you have some students who hate participating and you have to devise ways of doing that and a lot of those can then be replicated online so you can break in, depending on which tools you have available you can break them down into separate rooms where they're set off on a group task in a smaller group and then come back to a kind of plenary session, that sort of uh, activity where building in requirements on students that they, whether they have to present to a seminar or, or you know, collaboratively put together a presentation that can be done online as well as it, uh, not as well, it can, can be done on the line in a different way to how you do it face to face, but those sort of techniques are, are translatable as well. Um, so I suppose it's kind of thinking creatively around, you know, how online alternatives can help to deliver some of the same experience of, of a sort of seminar discussion. I think there's a really difficult, uh, really important question here. And uh, it's one of those kind of, how do you marry up aspects of teaching together through module design i think is uh could you give ideas about possible methods to integrate concerns over equity over accessibility etc with course requirements such as online assessment or attendance and i suppose it's you know also pointing us towards you know how do we design in such a way that facilitates greater kind of inclusion and uh, attributes for students um, I think it's, I think there are, there, there are media choices that can help because some types of media are more compatible with the kind of tools uh, that say people with disability might have anyway. So screen readers and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm trying to make online materials um, in a way that can be used by the standard um, uh, tools that, that are out there in use is one aspect. Um, if it's core pieces of teaching that say perhaps are very um, very visually based, um, then there may be a need to think of presenting those or presenting something else as an alternative um for for some students so alternative formats it, it in, increases the amount of work but is often also necessary um where for instance where, where we use anything that's graphic or visually based so you know graphs and charts or using photographs and teaching and that kind of thing if it's a core bit of teaching then we also have to provide a written description of those uh, of those items to make them accessible to people who might have a visual impairment, for example. Um, so there's a whole there are those um, uh, there are those kind of things to deal with. But um, and I think in in terms of online assessments, um, there would in any case, I guess, in assessment environments, be a differentiated approach uh, for assessments for students who need it. Um, whether that's providing more time or providing other ways they can complete the assessments. Um, uh, that, that also needs thinking about. Uh, the, the question is also asked, uh, not just only disabilities, but also inaccessibility to the internet. So how, how can we compensate for that? Uh, well, uh, it, I think it's extremely difficult. Um, and that's where um, the, the, the difficulties of people who come who might be in a variety of circumstances might not have uh, good internet access they might not have you know the difference between someone who has a, a room or a spare room they can use for their study for uh, and someone who has to kind of do it on the kitchen table with the 
the family all around them uh, increases the burdens immensely um, on them. Um, there, I think it's something the university, that's, I, I would have thought that's something that's more a university uh, level concern about how you address that. Um, and, and there may be, you know, very kind of financial, financially sound reasons for the universities to invest in, A, a invest in the provision of alternative formats. Mm -hmm. You know, if they lose students, they lose thousands of pounds of income. So it, it, arguably it's a case that universities, if, where students are in need of that kind, uh, look to investment in that, to providing students with laptops if that's what's needed. You know, five, six hundred, eight hundred pounds on a laptop compared to nine thousand pounds of fees sounds like a good investment if it's going to keep the students um, uh, uh, engaged and learning with you. Um, so I think those kind of things are important, but surely the university should have policies and approaches to assisting students anyway, and they need adapting for more online learning uh, pretty urgently, I would have thought. <laughs> I would definitely agree with that. Uh, and I think what you were saying about kind of uh, diversity of kind of resources for students is something really interesting because uh, I, I wouldn't have thought to kind of make different versions of the same information. I, I would think you'll know, get a variety of information through a variety of mediums. I wouldn't think to duplicate it. And I think that is kind of uh, really important actually because everyone learns in different ways. If you've got a core piece then you know that again is something you've got to think about and it's that investment uh that we've got to start working towards mm -hmm. uh and not just for now but for the kind of long-term future mm -hmm. uh i would i would suggest uh before we all sign off uh william that you do look at the chat because 90 percent of it is people saying thank you for a great presentation and some really <laughs> helpful insights uh and that I will now echo that uh, to yourself. Thank you very much for kind of presenting this. It's incredibly timely, incredibly useful. I will be using and thinking of all of this uh, and kind of stuff I should be doing and thinking about over the next you know, five years, not just because of the blended learning pandemic uh, impact. So I think uh, I will echo everyone's sentiments in chat to say thank you very much uh, with one minute to go uh, thank you everyone for turning up it's been uh, really lovely hearing from William but also kind of uh, seeing everyone here today so uh, look out for our next lot of webinars uh, onwards and upwards thank you very much goodbye yeah,